Well, good afternoon, everyone. I have 12 o'clock noon. This is uh, Michael Wojcik, Chief Development Officer for the Massachusetts region. I want to welcome all of our staff and volunteers to our first uh, all virtual, all staff call slash virtual teams meeting uh, in this uh, March's Red Cross Month. And uh, I've, uh, some of you know, I've been uh, a longtime Red Crosser and uh, uh, those who have been with the organization for a period of time know uh, that March is Red Cross Month and, and for many uh, who have been long timers, uh, uh, March is the month that we celebrate ourselves and we celebrate uh, the good work that we all do, whether we're paid staff or volunteers or advocates for the organization. And as I got up this morning and thought about this really remarkable meeting that we're about to have um, with a jam-packed agenda, um, I came to the conclusion uh, that there has never been a March and never been a month and never been a year where we have been more needed than now. And I just want to thank everyone on this call for your service and your commitment to the organization and your leadership. I also want to make a quick note for everyone who's now dialing into the call to please uh, put your phones on, uh, put your uh, uh, Teams meetings on mute. If you're not speaking, please put your uh, sessions on mute so that uh, we can hear uh, those who are presenting. And, and again, welcome to those who are just now dialing into the call. Um, again, it's Michael Wojcik. Uh, we have a jam-packed agenda, so I just want to say welcome. And again, a welcome to March's Red Cross Month. It is our month to shine, and we are doing just that. With that, I'm going to introduce just a couple of key slides and then turn it over to Holly Grant, who will introduce our featured speakers. So, Sarah, if you're able to... Uh, to lead us through. So our agenda today is uh, to welcome new staff. I'll be taking care of that. Uh, and then Holly's gonna uh, give us some remarks on uh, operating in a COVID-19 environment and then uh, introduce and, and welcome our speaker, featured speaker, Juliet Kayyem, who is on our regional board. And as many know, uh, a renowned um, Homeland Security expert and CNN uh, uh, commentator. Uh, so we have two wonderful new staff members, one who's on board now and one who is forthcoming. Barbara Cotton, our new executive director in Southeast Mass. And uh, Barbara has joined us at a remarkable time and um, has jumped right in. And coming on April 6th is our new director of service to armed forces, uh, Christine Platzik. Um, and I uh, had a chance to meet her recently and she's gonna be a wonderful addition. And I wanna say thank you to Marsha O'Doherty who's been serving in that role for uh, just over a year. So thank you, Marsha, and we look forward to meeting uh, Christine on April 6th. And with that, I turn it over to Holly, who's going to talk to us about operating in a COVID-19 environment. So thank you all. Great. Thanks, Michael. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's so nice to all to, to be. I can I can feel you all kind of with, with me here um, as we launch our first kind of all staff call our, our monthly all staff call um, in a in a true kind of virtual environment. So so I wanted to kind of just start off first of all by thanking each one of you. I know we are going through a time that is completely unprecedented and it is challenging us professionally and personally personally in ways that we haven't been challenged certainly in our lifetime. And you know, I'm not at all surprised uh, in in how our Red Cross team here in Massachusetts has come together. Um, that teamwork that I'm seeing, the kindness, the support that you're all providing one another, you know, as we move through this is just really exceptional. Um, and I just couldn't be more proud of each and every one of you as we as we navigate our way through this. Um, you know, as Michael mentioned, you know, the um, our services are needed kind of more than ever. And I want to spend a couple of minutes kind of talking through, you know, how we're operating, you know, what, what we're focused on and um, what we're still able to do kind of, you know, in the in the world that we're living in right now. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, all of the work that we're doing, um, national and division lead leadership has been intimately engaged um, and supportive of us as we navigate through this. Um, and we are an incredibly resilient organization and I know all of us Red Crossers are very resilient people you know we we will get through this and we'll get through this together so when we talk about kind of how we're operating I know you've I hope you've been reading the emails that I've been sending out um, you know every couple of days kind of giving you updates um, but uh, you know our focus is um, twofold one is protecting our workforce 
um, that is paramount to all of us. And and while we do that, also find ways that we can continue to safely deliver essential services um, that we can provide kind of during this outbreak. So um, so pr protecting our workforce and all of you is is um, paramount to us, you know, as we move through this. And I wanted to just kind of highlight a couple of public health um, messaging here, right? So I want to just reinforce that you know, whether you're, you know, working um, externally for us in the Red Cross or just even your own personal lives, we should all really be taking seriously kind of the need to practice social distancing in both our professional and personal spaces and then just practice good health habits. I know you've been seeing a lot of the communications that have been coming out, but, you know, take care of yourselves, wash your hands, don't touch your eyes, mouth and and knows, uh, you know, make sure you're managing your stress. You know, we're all working um, in different ways that we aren't used to working. Um, so, you know, find ways to take care of yourself. Self-care is really important as, as, as we move through this. So, um, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes, like I said, and just kind of highlight some of the key things that we are continuing to do and how we're operating. So in the disaster cycle services, you know, uh, disaster, um, we are continuing to respond to local disasters. We do have additional screening pro protocols that have been in place for our disaster action teams, both for the responders as well as for clients. Um, we've stood up our con op structure. We've been operating in a modified con op structure um, for the last week or so, we've now moved fully into um, our, our con op structure, which means we have like a regular, we have a structure and a regular cadence of meetings twice a day so that we can all kind of coordinate the work that's happening on the disaster side. Um, there are also, uh, you know, work being done to prepare for potential move to shelter in place. We know the shelter in place ordinance is in, is in place in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we're thinking ahead in case we get to that point here. Right now, the governor has not said he's planning to do that, but just in case um, we are planning for that. We have our disaster um, uh, staff embedded in our state EOC, our emergency operations center, and we are doing mass care planning with MEMA and with our partners. And our focus there is really on the feeding piece um, in times like this. And many of you may have heard, you know, that this morning there was a large earthquake in Salt Lake City. And I think kind of the 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 work that our, our Red Crosses are going to be doing in Salt Lake City is going to be super important. And, you know, we need to be able to um, continue to be able to respond in in those key ways you know when when disasters happen and that's kind of what what people are counting on but again doing it in an environment where we can keep our workforce safe um, in the area of, of the work that we do to support military members and their families um, our work has pretty much gone remote so our hero care center which provides emergency communications is operating remotely that's our 24 7 um, uh, support for for families. We also are doing our case management for for families and our restoring family links. That's all being done remotely. All of our trainings and for service the armed forces resiliency trainings and our international humanitarian law um, classes have all been canceled or they have been rescheduled. Um, in terms of the work that uh, is very kind of unique unique here in the Boston area, you know, we do have our big food pantry, you know, which serves, um, you know, 150,000 people a year. Um, our food pantry is open. We have redesigned kind of how we're actually delivering the service. Um, I was actually there this morning uh, uh, with David. David's just done a phenomenal job with his team, um, reorganizing it so that we can continue to provide food to those people in need. Um, sanitation and social dist distancing guidelines have been put in place. Client pickup is different for those of you who've been to the food pantry. So people who arrive in cars, it's a drive through now. So we're just putting, again, using social distancing, we're just putting the food in people's cars and they can kind of drive away. Um, and the team has also put together survival kits with basic supplies that are going to be delivered to the Boston Public Schools and distributed to the Boston Public School students and, and families. In the training services space, um, we are continuing um, to uh, hold our kind of life-saving training, so our basic life support, CPR, first aid, AED, bloodborne pathogen trainings, and they are conforming with the social distancing where possible. If we cannot do a training where we're maintaining that 
you know, that's that that distance, that six foot distance, those trainings are getting canceled or they're being postponed. We are also kind of providing some additional flexibility for certification. So, you know, we have many emergency responders that get trained and certified through the American Red Cross, which is why keeping kind of this line of service open again, using social distancing is like really important kind of in this time um, and providing kind of that flexibility around certifications. On our blood services side, um, we, you know, continue to need blood. And I think you've probably heard, you know, a lot of the communications that we've been sending out, you know, due to all the schools being closed and colleges and the social distancing that's in place and many businesses kind of have shut down in the short term. We have many blood uh, drive cancellations in Massachusetts just alone. We've got 146 blood drives kind of that have been canceled over the next month or two, which totals over 4000 units. And when you think of each unit of blood being able to save three lives, we're talking about that impacting 12000 people. Nationally, we have uh, 2,700 blood drives that have been canceled. So we are, you know, we have additional safety protocols that we've put in place, including social distancing. You know, there is, um, you you can donate blood safely, and we're we're, um, you know, testing, doing temperature checks and other safety protocols in place for our volunteers and for our employees and for our blood donors. Um, our executive directors are kind of working with the elected officials um, and our local chambers and other partner organizations to see if they can kind of help us find new blood drive locations um, and encourage people to donate. Because um, obviously I think as everyone knows, you know, 40% of the blood supply in the United States comes from the Red Cross. So we need to be able to keep that, that blood supply literally kind of flowing. And then on the operations side, um, again, just to kind of reinforce what um, what you've seen kind of in emails, you know, our, our facilities are closed to the general public. They are open for training services and biomedical services. You know, as I mentioned with those caveats, with social distancing kind of in place for what we are still offering. Um, signage is on the doors, you know, to let people know if anyone does come to our office, you know, how they can reach out to us. And mail's being picked up. Um, and, and like I said, our blood donation fix site centers are open um, and our blood services processing center in Dedham is also opening, again, following social distancing and safety protocols. So the one last thing that I wanted to mention before um, before I introduce you all to our guest speaker, and I know Juliet's on the line, so, so um, I want to get to her uh, really quickly, um, is in, a, in order for us to kind of continue this work that we're doing in this COVID-19 environment, there are some additional investments that we need to be able to continue to support our work. And you'll you'll hear more about it, but the focus of our, of our development team is going to be raising resources that can help ensure that we can maintain a sufficient supply of blood because we're going to need to do blood drives differently. We're going to need to do uh, more blood drives and smaller blood drives to really kind of adhere and, and support the containment and, and and stop the spread of the virus. So we need to do things differently in terms of our blood collection. Um, and we also um, are needing to rethink and do some different training around our disasters, kind of big and small. Um, so you'll, you'll hear for more from our development team, but those will be some additional investments that we're gonna be looking for to be able to continue our work um, in this incredibly uh, critical time. So, I would like to uh, now introduce our guest speaker. I'm um, Juliet. I, I can I just double check and make sure we can hear you. Juliet, you're on. We can't hear you if you're on. And Holly, this is Ryan. If she was muted, she can hit star six to unmute herself if she called in. Okay, give me one second. She just texted me, so I know she's I know she's on. So let me just uh, just work on work on the audio. So while 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 can you she hear me now? Yay! There you are. Yes, wonderful. So I wanted oh, to. Sure. Now, are you seeing me or just hearing me? We are just seeing you, but if, you, if you're able to turn on, now we can see you. Thank okay, you. I just turned it off, but I will. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. 
Great. Well, let me let me introduce you, Juliet. And and first of all, I know you've got so much on your plate right now. I so do. We, I do. Yeah. Only because the president just finally invoked the Defense Production Act, which I'm so excited about, which I can explain to everyone. Oh, wonderful. Um, Great. Yeah. Well, again, we're so grateful that you joined our call today. Um, let me tell, for those of you who don't know Juliet, Juliet um, is a member of our regional board of directors. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about, she's just a, she's got an incredible background. And like I said, we're so grateful that you're taking time to Thank speak with you. us today. So she is world renowned, highly regarded kind of expert in all things security and emergency preparedness. Um, many, of you, many of you may know her because she is a national security analyst on CNN. Um, you also may hear her on NPR, kind of here in the, in, in, um, in the Boston area or nationally. Um, she's a professor and faculty chair of Homeland Security and Security and Global Health Rights at the JFK School of Government at Harvard. Um, and in her spare time, I don't know how you do all this, Juliet, but uh, she's also a CEO of and co-founder of a tech startup that's focused on, uh, it's called Grip Mobility, that's focused on providing transparency in the rideshare industry. Um, and, you know, her background includes um, serving as assistant secretary at the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama administration, um, in the Governor Deval, Deval Patrick's administration here in Massachusetts. She was also kind of a Homeland Security Advisor. She is just got an incredible background and level of expertise. And again, we are so thrilled to have you. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Juliet. So thanks, Juliet. Thank you so much. And I'll talk just for a little bit uh, what I know, what I don't know. Um, and um, and maybe just try to put a little bit method to the madness of what you're probably seeing um, uh, in the administration, uh, you know, not on the administration, on all levels. Um, so as you, a lot of you know who are on the, on the um, disaster side, first of all, thank you for everything you do to maintain everything that needs to get done and everything that we're going to be dependent on you. Um, it's weird times. I've, I've been predicting that this, that we would have something like this for a while. And I still find it what a weird, if you can see CNN has set up a studio right behind me. So I even can practice social distancing. Um, and, um, and it's just strange. And we're asking you to commit to help in ways that, um, you know, give me a hurricane any day at this stage, right? Um, so um, just really, really thank you. And I'm really proud to be a part of this effort and to try to amplify um, what you're trying to do. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes to tell you sort of where we are and where I think we're going um, and where we have been. So as you know, a crisis has five stages. Um, the first is protection, sort of protect us from the bad thing happening. And that would have included a much stronger sort of global surveillance system, food security, uh, intelligence systems that prepared us or that were able to, to um, get a to see a, a, a new virus early on um, that that uh, but then the coronavirus formed in ways that are really weird and involve monkeys and stuff but nonetheless um, uh, the first reports of a strange virus in China from what we can tell were as early as late November we know that the US government certainly knew about it by December and we spend a lot of time hoping that China could contain it, China's aggressive containment action. So that was sort of uh, what I would describe as sort of December to March period. Um, that did not work. And in the meanwhile, it's just fair to say we lost some time as a country in terms of um, um, in terms of moving forward um, and um, and um, uh, 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 preparing, and that inc includes test kits, that includes first responders, that includes, you know, protecting first responders, that in includes communicating to the American public what could happen. I think the failure of the test kits meant um, that, or the failure of having distribution of test kits is why we got to community or social isolation or um, flatten the curve, call it whatever you, you want, or slow the curve, flatten the spread, whatever, all those things. Um, uh, I think we got to it so quickly because of the lack of transparency. Um, uh, uh, that, that because we did not know how much community um, 
to how much it, how much community spread we had, uh, governors and mayors were forced to just shut everything down relatively quickly, just seeing the numbers that they were seeing in particular out of Italy. And so that's why last week was so mind boggling. You just saw the headline was the same. The state was different, right? The headline was the same. The state was different. Um, and so this state does that. That state does that. It was the same thing. They were all going towards massive social distancing. And, in a, you know, and you saw the federal government finally sort of recognize that only this Monday when it began to give national guidelines. So just remember that sort of it, it was it was a 50 state sort of response without sort of federal guidance. So now we're in the essentially the lockdown phase. And so what should you anticipate? So next up is the surge. We are surging, um, surging resources. The president today just invoked the Defense Production Act, which I've been urging for weeks. It's got to get stuff moving. We got to get the kits. We got to get the respirators. We got to get beds. We got to get ICU capacity. We have to get the military support. We know how to do this. It just took a while for the president or for the federal government to sort of invoke it. So things will start to move. Um, and that's great because the goal is not that we stay socially isolated like this. The goal is that we, as a country, are able to have capacity reach need or need reach capacity. You want those to be in the same place. So, and that is gonna be hopefully well before a vaccine. Uh, the vaccine we do not anticipate um, until about um, 18 months from now. So that can't be our sole goal. Our goal is essentially to manage this virus by managing the number of people who get it and managing our capacity to respond to them. And so I'm very optimistic that now that we sort of have alignment amongst the 50 states and alignment between need and capacity, or at least trying to, uh, that we will get out of this in the next three to four weeks, hopefully, uh, or at least out of this intense social distancing side, and then be able to move forward. So if you ask me as a mother of three kids, what is my, um, you know, wh what am I saying at home? I'm saying we've lost March and April. I just have no doubt about that. I don't think March and April will be normal. Um, maybe some things open up, maybe some schools, I doubt colleges and universities will. Um, and then May we start to reconstitute, and June we um, we um, we start to seem normal. That's sort of what's in my head. And the normal is not there's no coronavirus. The normal is we're able to match capacity with need. So that's sort of where we are. If that's helpful, just sort of put them. I mean, you know, the madness. There's a lot of madness, but that's that's how I'm looking at it. And I'm much more optimistic this week than I was. Um, uh, uh, than I was last week for two reasons, because of that alignment and because um, of the alignment of guidance and because you're starting to see the surge. So that's all I have. I don't know if there was anything more on this front, but let me know. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Julia. Um, can we open it up for questions? And if people have questions, maybe you could either put them in the chat box. Okay, great. Oh, I'm learning about all these things. I'm becoming so, there we go. Um, can you see the chat box? Yes. So there, there are any questions? So what do you, let me, let me ask you, you know, so this is, this is obviously kind of such an unprecedented time that we're, that we're dealing with right now. What do you, like, how would you suggest we kind of manage it, like in terms of coping? I mean, there. Yeah. This is, I think, testing us in, like, you know, I keep saying, professionally and personally, in ways that we've never really been tested. Certainly, certainly, our generation. Um, and so, you know, any kind of suggestions there, you know, in terms of uh, building resiliency and at home. So I did write a book uh, called Secure. So I mean, part of it is. Um, I mean, I tell everyone, just get a battle rhythm, exercise if you can, take your showers, get the kids into a battle rhythm. I will say, I sort of, I did, I mean, I'll get personal just because I sort of know how to do I mean, I, I gave, I'm giving the kids a bit of a break this week. I think I have older, I have teenagers because I just think it's such a shock to the system. I don't think they're going back to school. And so I just, and they don't get to see anyone, no play dates, none, none, none. Um, I let them go for walks with the dog alone or um, 
one of my, one of my kids drives and I let him drive around like he just wants to get out of the house. Um, but um, yeah, I'm pretty strict about it. So I give them a little bit of a break. So there's not really lots of rules right now. And I, I warn them that I'd start to regiment it. And then if you think that we're here three or four weeks, you're going to want a battle rhythm of reading or online classes or um, games with the family or cooking or just something to break up the hours so they always have something in the next three to four hours to look forward to. Um, and then, you know, you're the adult in the room. And so um, act the adult, you know, that, that this is, you know, I, I hear my girlfriends and, uh, um, and, you know, it's, it, it's not healthy for kids to experience a parent who's not um, able to just put this in perspective for them and, and to talk about the common good, that this is really saving lives. Um, if you have 20 year olds, you know, just get on their case seriously. Um, and if you, um, about staying home, and if you have younger ones, you know, I, I, they have some sense that something is new. So definitely, um, you know, I'd be, I'd be honest with them. Great. Thanks, Juliet. So there are a couple of there are a couple of questions that have come in. So the first one is from Eileen Skinner, who's also on our regional board. She's the head of Shriners Hospitals for Children in Boston. Hi. And uh, so her question is, what is the federal government doing regarding maintaining the food supply and access to medications? Um, yes. So I actually think that, and I'm, I'm monitoring because the president just invoked the De Defense Production Act, so I'm going to have to answer an NPR email in one second. But um, um, so I am not worried, I'll be honest with you, I'm not worried about the supply chain on either medications, other medications. Is that what you meant? Um, or do you mean medications related to the coronavirus? She didn't say, but you know, it could okay. be both. I mean, honestly. Okay, so so right. we are gonna have a deficiency of capabilities on the coronavirus side, and that's gonna impact the public uh, public health generally. If you don't have enough beds for one thing, you're not gonna have beds for others. That's why we are stopping elective operations now. It's why it's also why we stay home. So we put less of stresses on public health or public safety. We don't get into car accidents. We don't fall off the, the uh, bench, you know, whatever it is that gets us to a hospital. Um, and it's important that we continue to do that. The surging of resources, I think, and the invo invocation of the Defense Production Act are important. Those will happen right now. Um, and I think you're going to see alignment between um, capacity um, in time, but it won't be fast enough. So, so you know, m success is do fewer people die because of this. I hate to say that. So because we've seen some projections in the two millions for the U.S. That's assuming we don't do anything. So what we're trying to do is get that number much lower. Yeah. On the food supply step, the only issue I have is, um, is personnel. And that's why um, workforce safety and workforce health safety is really important right now. The supply chain will keep moving. Um, neither Italy or China experienced ma massive deprivations. I just went to the store, whatever happened the other day when everyone went crazy, everything was restocked. We don't anticipate that kind of shortage. Um, and, and, and so long as our workforce can remain relatively healthy, even with a 25% decline, we should be able to, we, we should be perfectly fine. I, I've been to the market twice in the last two days. The one thing about hoarding or not hoarding, but the one thing you do want to remember is you don't want to be at the market that often. So one of the reasons why you want to stock up is not because of hoarding, but because of other um, issues. Hold on one second. Uh, just, yeah. Hold on, let me just see. Yep. Yeah. Um, it is uh, uh, different uh, levels of activation. Um, I'm on call now. I'll just tell him. Can <laughs> I call you in 15 or so? Okay, sorry about that. No, no, no. Um, so could you talk a little bit more, more about kind of the declaration that the president just made? Yeah. And, and you know, one of one of the questions here is, you know, we have donors that are wondering about, you know, when are more test kits going to be available? Yeah. Will this kind of act that the, that the, that the president just passed expedite or facilitate you know i know there's lots of numbers out there of how many more kits are going to get out there so does this how does how does this all help in terms of the tracking of the disease so it basically 
Um, well, look, the kits, the failure to have kits is the original sin, but it's the only thing that's going to get us out of here. So because we have to have kits to be able to have localized and specific testing to see who's sick, because our goal is the person who's sick then gets isolated rather than all of us being isolated. So while it's the original uh, original sin, it's our only solution. So that's just every, so um, we have lots of test kits coming in now. We just just read that the military is bringing over about 300, 400,000. And we're going to need millions, um, but I think that that process is working now. It just took, it just took eight weeks too late. Like my frustration is just, we knew in January we would need kits, so I think kits will become available. And then once we can get the, in I would say probably two to three weeks time. So I'm, I'm in this two to three week time frame that if we can get our act together, a lot will be solved. Um, and so. Yeah. So that's sort of where we are on the kit. So we are now, I am happier than I was last Thursday. I just want to say that I feel like both we have unity of mission and we have, you know, unity of production or unity of movement uh, with, with, um, with things moving now, which makes me happy. So can you, can you, there's a question here in the queue around, you know, testing in, in this surge phase. So yeah. why is testing so important in the surge phase? Because we're surging so that we can take care of all the people who are likely to get sick. And, but we test to be able to um, make that the refinements on who's sick better because um, because we don't want to socially isolate all the time. So let me put it a different way. We are socially isolating right now so aggressively because we don't have the capacity to tell who's sick. So if you think, so the surge is happening parallel to the social distancing. The surge is to get stuff for all the people we think who are already sick or who may get sick because we were late on social distancing. Um, the social distancing is just to not increase that pool. Eventually, when we have kits, we'll be able to tell who has it or not. Someone comes down with symptoms or is even asymptomatic, but may have been around someone with symptoms, and then we know how to respond. Great, great. Thank so you. The, the, think, of, think of the surge right now as we are bracing for impact because we were so late in identifying community spread. Great, thank you. So there's another question here related to, um, you know, how does this pandemic affect Homeland Security? Right? Yeah, so good question. Um, so, you know, I study Homeland Security and issues around it. And, you know, it's been a challenge because it had become so immigration focused that I think those of you who deal with FEMA may have even felt the impact. Um, and um, right now, though, we're finally, the president just put FEMA to, to response regional you know response level one which is due to um which is full staffing and all emergency support functions and interagency liaisons are invoked um um and that just basically means you know all hands on deck uh which is about time so i think you're going to see uh, maybe a chance for fema to, to to get some maybe good play i hope um after puerto rico uh and i think you're going to start to see the department focus on um, on that now, the, on, on the response side more than it has on the immigration side. Great, thank you. So um, so, so going back to just the pharmacy, the, the pharmacy question around medications. Uh -huh. So um, so the question was uh, specific to retail pharma pharmacy. Yeah. So any kind of additional insight on that in terms of, do you think there's going to be shortages or do you think- I do not. I, I'm being very honest. I do not. I mean, the only shortages I see is personnel shortages. I do not anticipate the shortages, but let me tell you something. People are so focused on food to the extent that you can get out. The, what are the things that you're going to need immediately? Medications and diapers or, or stuff for babies. So generally elderly and young. That's the kind of thing to hoard on. So, th so that's what I would position for now. But I just, I just got a prescription filled for a non-related, non-emergency thing at CVS, and it was totally fine. Mm -hmm. Great. So Great. I'm, I'm anticipating it. it, it I'm, I'm, I'm that, that of the, I do worry of the things I worry about. That is not one of them. Okay. Great. So there's another question in the queue um, here. It says, why yeah. is it that it appears that the rich and famous, <clears throat> kind of in air quotes, all have access to the test? However, the rest of us are told to self-quarantine and deal with it on our own when we are sick and think we may have the virus. Uh, 
Uh, so all I can say is a crisis hits a nation as it is, not how we wish it would be. Um, and, uh, you know, private companies have access to the kits, uh, including institutions like the NBA and rich people. And it's just it's just the way it is. I mean, there's no explanation for it. Then anything, you, any way that you want the country to be, it won't be during a crisis. And every you know, inequality that existed before will get exacerbated. It's just, I just say it to prepare people, but we're not going to solve health care through this. We might solve it after. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think what we're hearing you say, though, too, just on the testing is that, you know, there are more kits, many, many more kits that are coming. So hopefully, you know, more people will get tested and uh, and, and maybe that, that inequality that we, that, that does kind of seem to appear kind of in the yeah. media, at least. Exactly. Maybe changing, yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. there's, so there's another question in the queue here around how do we maintain societal discipline in the weeks ahead when the number of new cases decrease but are still occurring? Um, so, <laughs> um, I mean, focus on the surge is one thing. The faster we can get through this response and get things moving, the less damage we would have done to the economy and so many of us. So I know there's lots of focus on, you know, money and disaster relief and everything. I am like, can we just focus on making this end? Because once all of us get to spend money again, we will. Um, we'll gladly spend it. We're all sick of you know, cooking. So, um, so I think that that's um, one way uh, to do it. And then, you know, on a personal level, obviously, p some people are hurting more than others. Um, so, you know, to try to figure out ways in which you can um, support them. Um, and then I think you're starting to see stuff from the federal government um, on this. So, you'll, you know, um, uh, in terms of resources for individuals who would need it. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so someone just asked, what's your favorite recipe? It sounds like you're doing a lot of cooking there. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's hilarious. Um, so, uh, God, I've just, I've gotten down to the basics. My problem is I'm a carb eater during, uh, during like moments like this, like I'm about to go on CNN, NPR just called. I, I, so I, cause I get munchies. I just eat muffins. It's the worst thing. And I just, I, and I, ugh, it's horrible. Don't look at me. I mean, I'm like, I need to start eating uh, fruit. But last night we had, kebabs and then i think tonight we're gonna have fish uh, great nothing too fancy great great uh, another question came in so do we have any models for economic recovery following this period of initial impact no thank you no it's a great question we do not i mean i think you're seeing percentages of unemployment up to 20 percent, and that, that seems high but then when you think of retail industry but i I don't know if we know what the impact, the economic impact will be. Um, so that's why I just focus on, can we just get to stabilization? Because then, then we'll have a pool of harms that we can know that we'll have to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great that's, point. I mean, that's my, that's my, you know, that's my only answer. Um, let's just get to the other side, then we can address it. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, are there any, I don't see any other questions in the queue. Any other, any other questions? No, I, just, I mean, just thank you again. I wish I, I wish there was more clear. I mean, I know what the metrics are. I know what we're trying to do and I'm just much more confident um, that we can do it. But, you know, it's basically, you know, as Holly was saying, I could hear the beginning, you know, steady state, try to get people to come out for blood, hope no other disasters happen. And then you all are leaders in your communities on this stuff. Just communicate. I mean, it, to the extent anything was helpful that I said it shouldn't be because I hope we would be hearing it from our government, but we're just not. So, you know, um, you know, just communicate in ways that are um, that help people get through this. Because I think it's the uncertainty of the length that's making people freak out. And so I think we just have to say, here's, we don't know how far away it is, but here's the goal. There is a goal, right? And that goal is not a vaccine. That goal is closer. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's really helpful. And and I just so appreciate you, you, you joining and, and sharing kind of your thoughts, because I think helping kind of give us more of a framework yeah around yeah. kind of what's happening, you know, and kind of where we're headed and what we can expect. It does kind of help with that kind of anxiousness that we all feel of just, just everything's been turned upside down. And yeah. so, you know, giving us that framework and helping us kind of understand, you know, what we can anticipate kind of seeing um, in the short term, or even in the midterm, knowing that we there's still lots of questions out there. Um, but I think that was like inc incredibly helpful and I and just really appreciate I really appreciate it. Oh, there's there 
Two more questions. You have, okay, do you have I mean, I'm going to have to get off just because I'm getting hit. I didn't realize the president was going to be off, but I'm happy to answer these two. OK, so uh, these are the last two. What is um, the best site for updates? The CDC has a has a six day lag on some information. So where do you, do you suggest people go, Juliet? Okay, so this is great. So um, I go to Johns Hopkins website. It is so up to speed and, and, they're, and they're accumulating all sorts of information. That's on outbreak patients deaths that's statewide so that is the best one i have found um i don't i don't have a lot of transparency on kits though i've seen numbers i just don't know if any of them are validated yeah okay great no that's helpful and then just just um that the whole kind of message around social distancing you know right. which we keep hearing which we're all working on practicing i'm a hugger it's really hard to kind of keep yeah. your distance from people but um you know, so is this kind of a short term thing? Is this a long term thing that we need I to be it, in? Or I is this think, really kind of just until the tests come out and we have yeah, a great I, think it's be, I mean, I think, you know, I think some of us will live differently and think about how we live and our touching and our hands and our hands washing. I think a lot of that might be better as I touch my face. I apologize. Um, but I don't think it's long. I mean, I don't know. I think on the far end, we're six weeks on the far end. I think just get your head around that it's April. Um, that we that we could be in some form of this through April. I could be wrong, but if I'm wrong, it's earlier. So then you'll be happy. I don't think it's much longer. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, Juliet, thank you so much. I know you've got a lot in your plate right now. We'll let you get back to you. Oh, <laughs> no, I appreciate Thanks this, and I'm so sorry much. I didn't know the president. Well, I'll be on um, NPR and CNN the rest of the day. It sounds like so. I'll see okay. you guys soon. We will turn you on then. All right. Thanks okay, again. Thank Juliet. you all for all you do. Bye. Take care. Be safe. Thank great. you. You too. Thanks. Great. Well, I just um, just to uh, I'll turn on my camera just to say goodbye to all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining. You can see I'm in my food pantry outfit here. Um, but again, just really want to thank each and every one of you. Um, the like I said at the at the front end of the call, like this is all of us coming together to take care of each other, take care of our communities um, and continue to uh, be safe and deliver deliver our Red Cross mission in the best way we can, in the most safe way we can. So just so appreciate each one of you and um, look forward to kind of reconnecting. We're going to try to do kind of more of these types of meetings. As you can see, we've kind of increased the cadence um, just so we can kind of stay connected virtually as, as we work through this. So I send you all a big virtual hug and um, stay healthy. Um, and uh, and look forward to seeing you all soon. All right, take care. Bye, Holly. Bye, Holly.